And I know the initial storyline is what the Michigan defensive line did, especially early in that game, had uh, five sacks in the first half. Jalen Milrow could not get through a read progression. He could not escape the pocket. That was all phenomenal. I, I want to talk about that here in a sec because I think people are not giving enough credit to the secondary for the University of Michigan. They gave up 116 yards passing. And part of the reason why Jalen Milrow had to sit back there and hold the football was because there was nobody open. And Jalen Milrow was one of the best deep ball throwers in all of college football and didn't hit a damn deep ball all day long. I mean, the front was phenomenal, but we got to give that secondary their flowers right now because they came to play. Flat out, man. And listen, this is what they'll tell you. It's the no-star defense. So I, the secondary will say, man, shout-out to the D-line. The D-line will say shout-out to the secondary. They'll bring the linebackers involved. But I think the mastermind behind all this, JP, is Jesse Minter mm -hmm. because he, the defensive coordinator, he's the one that gets this all to work together because sometimes it's the D-line that steps up. Sometimes the secondary holds coverage long enough for the D-line and the linebackers to get home. But, I mean, I know you appreciate great defense. They had an absolute phenomenal plan for a dangerous quarterback in Jalen Milrow and a dangerous Alabama offense, and they executed, I mean, A-plus. There was one or two plays that might have scared you as a Michigan fan, but for the most part throughout the entire game, Michigan had Bama's number. I agree with that. I think when uh, Alabama started going to more of the quarterback run, I think that's where the defense maybe had to take its edge off a little bit, and I'm not exactly sure why they didn't go to some of that earlier. But even at that point, Michigan started making the adjustments, and they started hitting Jalen Milrow. Jalen Milrow puts the football on the ground, ends up being a potential momentum swing. Of course, Michigan didn't score off of that, but the opportunity to get the football back in a game like that I think is really important. Like, the defense did all of the things that it needed to do. Now, to go back to that defensive line, uh, the sack numbers were ridiculous. It's something that we have rarely seen uh, against the Nick Saban team. Is something that we had not seen in the college football playoff up to that point. And when you talk about Jesse Minter, the defensive coordinator for Michigan, the thing that I love, and you get on the internet and you'll see people talking about some, oh, how come Tommy Reese couldn't adjust and how come, uh, you know, they didn't have an answer for these blitz packages. The, the, the way that they were sending guys, there's, there's not really an answer. Mm -hmm. You're showing dudes up at the line of scrimmage. You don't know who's dropping in. You don't know who's dropping out. You're trying to turn the protection because you see an overload, and all of a sudden they're bringing the overload from the other side, guys coming from depth. All of those different things, it was a masterfully created game plan that put a whole offense in a blender for half of a game. One of the biggest differences in this game, and it's subtle, and it probably won't get discussed, but it was the coordinators on both sides of the ball, what they did pre-snap. It was the pre-snap mind games that they played with Alabama that gave them the advantage. You mentioned the blitzes on, on defense. I had no idea mm -hmm. where the pressure was coming from. From a pre-snap shell, it could have came from everywhere, and it did come from everywhere. Yeah, we talked about the, the pre- and the post-snap looks, and you're, you're one who always points that out. And especially when you're going against a guy like Milrow where you know he has to – you have to affect his eyes in order to affect his legs. Yeah. Michigan did that 